This is Season 3, Episode 28 of In Touch with Terry, a podcast for aesthetic professionals. Today's episode is titled, How to Keep Lawyers from Circling Your Aesthetics Practice. There is this nasty little law that's been around for over 20 years called TCPA, Mm -hmm. Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It was designed to prevent people from getting telemarketing calls, but it has been modernized for the 21st century to address texting and text marketing, and everybody here has gotten it. So if a text message is part of a marketing campaign using automated Mm -hmm. equipment, and you don't have the patient's explicit written authorization to opt into a marketing campaign with texting, you can be fined $500 to $1,500 per text. It's just fodder for class action lawsuits for attorneys, why they can smell the money. Hey, everybody. Welcome to In Touch with Terry, which is our power-packed podcast for the medical aesthetic industry that brings you expertise, authenticity, more importantly, solutions that have proven to increase profitability, attract, convert, and retain more patients. And we feature some of the top industry experts as guests. Hi, I'm Terry Ross, former Fortune 500 executive, international speaker, and founder and CEO of Apex by Terry Ross and Terry Ross Consulting. Today's podcast is another one. I know I say it every time, but truly, guys, get your drink, get your coffee, get your pen and paper and sit down because I have a world renowned surgeon on this call with me who has, I don't know, more letters, more credentials. I mean, I'm thinking he built Harvard from the ground up, but it's a topic that is so vital. It's always been vital in in any um, therapeutic area of medicine. And what we're going to be talking about today is how to keep lawyers from circling your practice, right? We do not want that to happen. Dr. Jeff Siegel is a board certified neurosurgeon who trained at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Siegel also graduated from Conrad Law School with the highest honors. Can he get any better than that, guys, a doctor and a lawyer? Um, Dr. Siegel is also the partner of Bertadotto Law Firm, which is based in Dallas. In addition, he launched Medical Justice in 2002. And Medical Justice is a physician-based organization focused on keeping doctors from being sued and for frivolous reasons. In addition, Dr. Siegel founded eMerit, which helps physicians protect and preserve their reputations, particularly online. And I wanted to have him on today because the last couple of months, I have been getting so many questions and calls about people want to blast them. They're not happy with the treatment. They want to go write a bad review. I mean, he offers, again, I I can't, I don't know anybody. I'm so honored to know him and be a friend with him, but I don't know anybody that owns this much credentials. So again, you guys, this is so vital for you to sit down, take positive notes. And certainly there will be a call to action in terms of you finding him and reaching him. But um, Dr. Siegel also has established himself as one of the country's leading authorities in medical malpractice and online reputation. So with that being said, and without further ado, Jeff, thank you so much for being with me here today. Terry, it's a blast. By the way, I'm, I'm an authority on managing medical malpractice, not committing medical malpractice, correct? <laughs> <laughs> so important. And you guys, this is this is so nuts. I can't believe, you know, we've all been in this in this crazy pandemic. I know I'm still in Los Angeles where Hell, we're, we're, they just started to open up restaurants, but it's, it's felt like jail. But last year, I was with Jeff. So if you have not listened to my previous podcast, I encourage you to do so. But Tim, we were in Vegas. Dr. Siegel was with us at the medical spa show. We were keeping it real because that's what we do. We keep it real. We give you real solutions, real feedback, throwing out the F-bomb when we need to. But we had a super fun podcast, which was crazy that it was a year ago, Jeff, right? Yeah, we call it the judicious use of an F-bomb. <laughs> Don't want to overuse it, but sometimes it is absolutely relevant, correct? Right, absolutely. So, you know, Jeff, before we even get started with the things I want to talk about today, which you guys, it's keeping lawyers from circling your practice. And I know that's so vital for all of you to to do things within compliance, you know, within, within safety. But Jeff, can you just elaborate a little bit more both on medical justice and what that is, as well as e-merit? Yeah, exactly. So thanks. Uh, I practice as a trained and practice as a neurosurgeon for a decade. And I was sued one time for what I perceived to be a frivolous reason. The single expert um, who testified against me had actually been expelled from our professional society for delivering frivolous testimony. Yet there he was in the circuit making a very handsome living testifying against people like me. 
Um, the case was dropped about two weeks before trial. I never felt as if I won anything, just lost less. And I thought there has to be a better way. And I actually quit my day job and founded Medical Justice to hold these types of people accountable. Simply put, we pay the bills to file counterclaims and countersuits against unethical experts and attorneys. More broadly now, we've gained expertise in terms of de-escalating conflicts, conflict between doctor and patient, between doctors and employees. Anytime you have humans involved, there's the potential for conflict. A practice can see 2,000, 3,000 patients a year. Then there's always one, two, or three that slip through the door. Even when you get wiser and older and your, your red flags, you know, are, you're aware of all the red flags, they still slip through. And the question is how to manage that. We manage that. We're the fixers. Now, along the way, I got a law degree and made my mother unhappy by leaving medicine and, and practicing law also. But we do both. I mean, we're experts in the medical legal domain. And and what a shitstorm this past year has been. I see I, I led with that the COVID year. Just when I thought that things would stay calmer, um, it turns out that everybody's on edge. And that includes uh, patients and patients mm-hmm. interacting in practices and even employees too. Challenging year. Did you quit being a neurosurgeon to start the company? And then you ended up going to law school after? And did you go to law school because of this lawsuit that you had against yourself? Ultimately, okay, so the answer is yes. I did stop practicing right after that lawsuit. Um, And at heart, I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I've dabbled in other things. We started a biotechnology company. I guess I wouldn't call that dabbling. That was actually Mm -hmm. quite a a immersion into the, uh, the business world. And I had intended only to do that for one or two years and then um, kind of pass over the baton, but ended up doing that for a number of years. And by then, it had been a while since I had operated on anyone. And while I'm arrogant enough to believe that Mm -hmm. I could still do it, I'm not sure I could reasonably persuade anyone to go under the knife after five years. (laughs) So medical justice was the way we went. And we had, you know, quite uh, an audience at the time. At the time, it was you know, one of the earlier professional liability crises where you, it became challenging to, to get affordable med mal coverage, or even if you can get it. Um, And so put us on the map early on. And then we learned how to um, manage the online space. We started that about 10 years ago, creating a platform to capture feedback from patients to the point of service and get it uploaded to the dominant review site. And we've uploaded about 450,000 reviews since then. Now, I wasn't a believer in the online mm. space in healthcare, primarily because I'm not sure I would use the online world to find a doctor, but it turns out I'm the exception to the rule. And every year I become more and more of the exception to the rule. So um, the online world is actually amazingly valuable to anyone in healthcare. It is the cheapest marketing tool you can get. You're just deputizing your patients to tell their story. You just got to make it easy to do it. We make that happen. I love that. And Jeff, I'm so curious that within this past year, 2020 with COVID, did you see a drop in your business, an increase for different legality reasons? Was it flat? Like, what was the business for you? No, it's a great question. So our biz- the financial health of our business is tied to the financial health of our clients. And so um, many of our clients, particularly those in the cash pay for the quarter dip, it was pretty rough. And um, we hung out with our clients. We basically said, Don't leave us. We won't leave you. But the revenue um, certainly did decrease during uh, that time. And then it it picked up as the economy started to pick up. And a lot of it depends upon where you are in the country, because while we talk about the United States, we're really talking about 50 states and everyone experienced uh, COVID very differently. I am bullish on 2021. I do believe that um, as there's greater and greater uptake in vaccine. As we're taping this now, I think we finally went under 100,000 cases a day, which is a major milestone. I mean, we were up to 300,000 cases a day as more and more people are able to participate and get access to to vaccines. Um, as more people have had COVID and um, are probably not going to 
get severe illness. I do think we're going to see a lot of pent up demand for services that people have put on the back burner. I know that I'm ready to travel again and, and I'm so I'm so hungry to travel that our first trip is going it's not till November well the first um, pleasure trip is mm-hmm. going to be in November to Finland. So pause Amazing. to digest that. November in Finland. <laughs> there won't be any sun and it'll be ten <laughs> degrees below zero. I can't wait. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> we will be there either, like no COVID. <laughs> oh, wait. And then once we get there, we're taking the train to the Arctic Circle. It's called the Santa Express. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> anyway, well, I'll, I'll report back. Love it. Love it. Sounds amazing. Okay. So I want to, I want to dive, I want, I, I want to dive in. Um, I have six pretty critical questions that I think um, have come up that I think people would be vying uh, to know the answer to. So question number one is, uh, what happens if a physician, a practice, an owner gets a cease and desist letter because somebody was using their photos on Instagram and mm-hmm. obviously they want to sue you, they're asking for 60 grand, um, and then they're going to go file a complaint with the medical board. What should someone do? So this is a, a good question. I think the underlying um, direction of the question is that some practice has their own Instagram account with pictures of their patients and the target physician, the one who received the cease and desist letter, had a webmaster or marketing entity that accidentally used photos from the web, meaning that they were well intended, but they just assumed, Mm -hmm. as many people do, that if it's on the web, just take it. You know, it's a wild, wild west. If it's up there, scrape them away. And unfortunately, it gets worse because many times these are these are defined or labeled as examples of patients in your practice. So, Mm -hmm. number one, you've got a copyright issue. That is, Mm -hmm. you've taken someone else's pictures and the law frowns upon that. Number two, there's a representation that these this is your handiwork. These are your patients, Mm -hmm. your before and after pictures. So you've got two problems. So what would I do in the first situation? or in that situation, yeah. first, I'd do some homework. I'd first see, is it real? I mean, a lot of these letters go out and they may not even be real, meaning that they may be your patients. And I tell people, look, if you're going to stick pictures up on Instagram, just make them your patients, get mm-hmm. the proper authorization from your patients, make them your patients, and we'll never have to have this ugly conversation. But you need to make sure that the people who work with you, the marketing people in house, mm-hmm. if you have them or your third party vendors, understand that because you're the one in the crosshairs. Sure, you could hold them accountable, but it's going to come down to who's got the deeper pocket, who makes more money. And ultimately, the, the other practice mm-hmm. doesn't care. They just want to hold someone accountable. The easiest way to avoid getting into this mess is to use pictures of your own patients. Make sure you have the proper authorization, and we we can provide that uh, proper photo authorization. Um, and sixty grand. So let me comment on that sixty mm-hmm. grand. So there are so many practices that have received that have received cease and desist using photos like images of an eyeball, for example, on their website for an ophthalmologist. Mm-hmm. And the owner of that would be Getty Images. I think that's one of the world's largest. Yeah, a big one. Owners, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they're a big one. And they generally don't charge sixty grand. They're they're pretty good. They generally know what the market rate is. They're going to ask for two thousand, well, one thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Why do they pick that number? Because they know that um, to litigate it, it, well, it'll be cheaper just to pay them off, have them go away. You can then use the photo with you know, as a license. And mm-hmm. um, they know that if you start, if you lawyer up, it's going to cost more than that. So that's that's actually not a bad business strategy if you're getting images. Um, on the other hand, when someone asks for sixty thousand dollars, you're going to have to fight. Um, I will tell you that many cyber liability policies, and I don't sell cyber insurance. I don't make any money off referring it, but I will tell you that if you're shopping for cyber insurance or you're revisiting your policy. See if it covers something related to online infringement, copyright infringement. That way, mm-hmm. you can just pick up the phone, call your um, your broker or your agent and the insurance company, and they would hire a lawyer for you. So it, the, the time to 
nail all this down is before there's a problem. There are two types of insurance uh, policies that every practice never thinks about, but they should have. And I'm not talking about professional liability coverage. Number one, cyber insurance. The number of practices now getting hacked or with ransomware or uh, issues related to theft of other people's intellectual property goes up every year. The other one that nobody thinks about that can be very expensive to litigate if you don't have this is EPLI, which Mm -hmm. is Employment Practice Liability Insurance. EPLI, Employment Practice Liability Insurance, what is it? If an employee in your practice, if you fire them and they sue you for uh, wrongful termination, um, you didn't pay them properly, discrimination for age, sex, race, um, sexual harassment, the list goes on and on, you've you may have done nothing wrong, but you're going to have to defend yourself. At the very least, you got to pay for a lawyer, and that gets very pricey. The employment litigation is the second uh, – actually, it's the most common uh, lawsuit filed in federal court, and it's expensive. How do you prevent that problem from creating a, a big hole in your pocket? EPLI insurance. Did I, did I answer that question in an in a overextended way? <laughs> I did zig and Look, zag. I, I, I mean, think. I was taking I was taking copious notes. So I, I hope that if I'm taking copious notes, you guys listening are taking copious notes too. But I want to stay on this topic for just a, a few minutes. So clearly, there's, you know, you know, when we think about the aesthetic industry as a whole, right? You have your plastics, your ocular, your reconstructive, your med spas. There's so many facets of this business now, and it's growing. And then there's so many people wanting to to get into this business. So, and especially a lot of the people that tend like the AMSPA, they're there to learn. It can be private equity, right? There's a variety of people. What about the practices that are relatively new that um, don't, they don't have their own, you know, photos and they, you know, they can certainly use where, what they get from the vendors, but then, you know, people know that that's just cookie cutter photos right there. Um, clearly you're stating what is within compliance and what's the right thing to do, but how do you kind of, I mean, how do you get, how do you get around that? I guess it's just really encouraging the, what the, what the law is then. Yes. Yeah. So your question is a broader question, which is every job, every job description ask for experience. Mm -hmm. We want 10 years of experience. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you get 10 years experience? If nobody will give you the job. So Um, it's a chicken and egg (laughs) problem. Um, but ultimately, you're always going to have some patients, okay? I mean, if you're just getting started, you still have some. Roll out the red carpet to these people. Just mm-hmm. say, look, you know, I I really would appreciate your help. You obviously have faith in me, um, and I have faith in you. Would you be kind? And then make it helpful for them down the road. You pay them for the picture, you know, to use the pictures um, or give them and a just, discount or free services yeah. or something. You may need to put down, uh, well, actually, it's just a video. It's just a picture. So if it's just before and after pictures, Mm -hmm. for example, you can just put them up there. You just need the proper authorization from the patient. Yeah. Well, I think that begs a whole different thing. And that's probably a whole different podcast in of itself, because I think the other thing that I often hear is, Terry, my patients won't give authorization right? They don't want their pictures up. And so I'm going to, my call to action at the end of this, so you guys stay with stay with us here, is that um, Dr. Siegel probably has something through his companies, like a really legit uh, photo consent form that I think would be valid, right? For you guys to, if you don't have one, you need one, number one. Number two, make sure it's written correctly, that covers your ass. And then three, I've seen it structured, even when I had Lasky Aesthetics, for five years that you want to ask the question in a couple different ways, right? Can you use it for educational purposes? And I think to Dr. Siegel's point, if somebody's happy, they like you, they're there, they trust you, that we want other patients to see the outcome. So that can be just an internal use versus, you know, being on the internet or on the website. And so you might want to ask a different, you know, a couple of different ways that they can yeah. use that photo. There right, are Jeff? checkbox. Yeah. In, in the consent form or the authorization form mm-hmm. that we recommend, <clears throat> there are multiple check boxes on how the photos can be used. That way there's no misunderstanding. Certainly you want to use it for the medical record. Okay. That's the easiest box to check. The next may be for medical education, i.e. other doctors, maybe at a medical conference. Then C would be marketing, how marketing, mm-hmm. print, online, etc., social media. And with all of that, 
you've really nailed it down. I, I can tell you where it is, where I've seen authorizations that I don't care for. So, for example, mm-hmm. they come to the practice and there's a little tiny paragraph that says the mm-hmm. practice can use authoriz- has your authorization, use photos for any purpose whatsoever. Any purpose whatsoever. I mean, just think about that for a moment. Any yeah. purpose. Well, let me tell you how valid that would be mm-hmm. if you do use it. And it, let's say you use it for nothing other than online. It's not valid. It's not a valid mm-hmm. HIPAA authorization, and somebody's going to be really pissed off because they're going to say, "Look, you just gave me twenty-five documents to sign when I came into the practice, and I, yeah. I can't believe you didn't spell this out for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to get my procedure. So, right. yes, it's got to be done right." God, that's a mouthful. And but again, it's so critical, so vital, and I've I've seen it the exact way the exact way that you just said, which is the way that it should not be. So qu- thank you, Jeff. Amazing. Um, question number two, and I'm going to ask it in two different ways because this is this was just recently you know, brought up to me and I think that I referred somebody to you. <laughs> so um, what if there was no clinical documentation, right, in the charts at all by a provider and then somebody calls the office, they are having, you know, an adverse event, there's something wrong and they want their charts and, and there is none. What do you do? There are people who call the office and say, I want my records. And Mm -hmm. the general thinking is that, well, if the patient wants the records, they have to sign a HIPAA release form. And it turns out that if the patient is only asking for their own records, their own records, and it's not going to another provider or Mm -hmm. to a family member or wherever, you can just give it to them. Mm -hmm. You really can just give it to them. And if you've got it, just if they if they're okay with a paper copy, just mm-hmm. zero, you know, just uh, copy yeah. it and get it to them. You do need authorization if they want it by email because email is not considered a secure means of transmission of data, um, assuming it's not password protected and it's, you're not using a portal. But if it's just standard email, yeah, then you need the patient to sign off on that. We also have a template for email and texting just so that you get the proper authorization but be careful i think it's this is a good thing the answer I just gave you is a good thing because sometimes practices slip up by make by providing too much friction yeah getting the patient what they want and then that pisses them off and you've turned a minor headache into a bigger headache and it's, it's okay avoidable. that is amazing okay so 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 i'm going to repeat that back just so i'm clear too if the patient's just requesting their own files for themselves they don't need to sign anything but if it's going to be sent anywhere else they need to sign a hipaa compliant form and you have something that you know you have a template that they could use yes okay the second part to that question was maybe a little bit different i don't tell me if it, this is off topic but what if just a provider right? The nurse, the esthetician, the NPPA, whoever. What if they didn't chart? They didn't put in their clinical notes. They didn't just, th- so there are no notes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and then something happened and yes. the patient calls and wants their chart because something happened and they don't have any. Okay. So let's assume that it's fresh in everyone's memory. And we're just talking yep. about, let, let's say it's a two day gap yeah. <laughs> that Um, You were well-intended or whoever was in your office is well-intended and they were going to catch up on their charting on the weekend. But Mm -hmm. then the patient says, I had a problem and it's it's before the weekend. Houston, we have a problem. So what do you do? You give what you do is you document what you recall. You document what you recall. Now, you use today's date. So they call today. You don't go back. You don't go back. You just say, here's today's date on the top describing the events that happened two days earlier. And this is your best recollection that is it perfect. No, but is it good? Yeah, it's pretty good. Mm. And you know, it, this is not unusual. Um, when you think about real, real crisis type of activities, when you're saving someone's life, you, you can, you have to pick and choose. You can't, yeah. you either have to save the patient and keep them from dying or you can document. I have yet to meet the doctor that can contemporaneously document the saving of a life. You have to focus on saving the life. And so this is not uncommon. And in a perfect world, you would document sooner rather than later, particularly if it's a crisis situation and you know that documentation will be important. Here in the example you gave, the procedure 
likely went well. You had no reason to believe there was a problem and you were alerted to the problem on the phone. But I would then just say, here's today's date. This is what happened two days ago. And I would include the conversation on the phone. If on the phone they're saying there's a problem, I would then detail it down as well as the recommendations associated with that. Got it. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. Question three, and all of you guys know me, so I am not about coupons and Groupons and all that shit, right? (laughs) So when you do that, um, and stay tuned because I'm going to have a blog coming out about the value of not discounting. Um, and, And again, I think it's a little bit crazy in aesthetic medicine. It's the only therapeutic area that clients feel they can want to barter and ask for a discount for God's sake. But, um, you know, as it relates to the topic of this conversation with Dr. Siegel, you know, when we allow patients to self-diagnose, because if you go buy a Groupon, that's what you're doing. I'm just choosing to go buy it, whether I need it or not, or it's the right procedure. So say a patient buys the Groupon, they come into your practice and then, you know, they, they have complete unrealistic expectations and something happens. The challenge with Groupon, and I'm not a fan of Groupon in healthcare. It sounds like we're of like mind on that, primarily because of uh, the number of problems I've seen. Now, maybe it's maybe it's because I'm only seeing the problems, you know, where right, things sure. went badly. Um, but I do think the challenge is that it tends to, at least in healthcare, it tends to self-select for the mm-hmm. bargain hunter. Mm-hmm. And the purpose of Groupon is to give someone a taste of a business or a service or a vendor and that you you know they'll be wowed meaning that price won't be the barrier they'll come in they'll go oh my god i just love you you are just awesome and then they'll come back and pay full tilt forever the challenge is that at least with groupon and healthcare is that it does promote the bargain hunter yeah. and their goal is to continue to be the bargain hunter forever so maybe Groupon is profitable in some practices, but I I see the headaches. And the challenge is Mm -hmm. you have a person who's self-diagnosed. If if they're accurate and you're perfectly delighted taking care of this patient and it's managed, you've managed their expectations and you're on the same page, that's great. Good for you. If on the other hand, there's a disconnect, meaning you can't do what they want, uh, want, what the patient wants. And maybe they have a healthcare problem and you can't take care of them anyway, then that patient has been set up for disappointment. And if they're set up for disappointment, they're going to take it out on you. So you've turned a neutral situation where you didn't have this patient in the first place into a negative situation. Now you're in damage control. You're in damage control for a situation that wasn't even profitable or likely to be profitable in the first place. Can you tell I have negative feelings about this? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. I'm so passionate and so are you about my beliefs. And again, it's just from our, you know, let's, we're going to age ourselves, our, our, just our longevity and our years of being in this space. But it's true. It's like stick with integrity of your brand. You know, when, when I teach in my sales training course, it's funny because I show a picture of Tiffany <laughs> and a picture of Zales. You know, you get like a diamond for four ninety nine. You know, there's no discount thing in the window of Tiffany's. And so, you know, if we're going to get anything done on our faces or our bodies, you know, why would we, be, why are we buying a coupon? Why are we buying a discount online? So I think is the takeaway from that, you guys, is what Dr. Siegel said. And listen, no judgment. I mean, if that's what you choose to do, like do you, and I hope it's successful. We hope it's successful for you. But Dr. Siegel seeing the other side of it. So just something that we want you to be aware of, because again, this podcast is really, like I said, it's always keeping it real and showing you what the best practices are in the industry. Um, yeah, l- let me follow up with that. Yeah. So um, to your point, patient selection is the best way to have a happy patient. I mean, if you can manage their expectations and you deliver, they're happy. If mm-hmm. the expectations are mismanaged, they're not happy. So the key is to address and figure out why is the patient having the procedure? So if a patient comes in, for example, and they expect that some aesthetic procedure is going to allow them to nail that job if they're having professional failure right now, if it's going to allow them to have a successful relationship when the relationship wasn't satisfactory, that's not going to happen because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're not acting as a psychiatrist or psychologist. You're acting in the aesthetic space to make someone look and feel a bit better. 
managing expectations, patient selection. When I first started practice, I was out less than one year. I had a patient come in and said, you know, Dr. Siegel, I've heard so many positive things about you. Those three butchers before me, they just really did a number on me, but I've heard you're just the best. I was amazingly flattered. Instead of seeing that as the giant red flag that it was, um, mm. I took the bait. And then I became the fourth butcher as this patient went to the to the next one. Now, that was before the online world took off and I would have been slammed and, and destroyed yeah. online. My point is, is that I'm going to tie this back to Groupon. With Groupon, you don't have the benefit of patient selection as you do this back and forth dance to see whether they're a good fit for your practice and they believe they're a good patient for your practice. Right. Oh my God. Amazing. And, and, you know, look at knowing that you're a neurosurgeon, I just kind of want to underlie this, this comment that, you know, heaven forbid, I, I had a damn brain tumor. Like I'm not, I, I don't want to go get a, get a discount to have Dr. Siegel do my surgery. So I think something really key to just think about it and what he said, who is your avatar? Who is your ultimate? Who's your client? Like, what kind of brand do you want to be? What's your value proposition? Let's really get clear on that. Um, this is another thing that I see all the time. And I, like, it, it, even as a consultant, I give what I know to be true. That's within the compliance and within the law without being a damn lawyer or acting like one. But I know this. these, these three things I want to touch upon. One are sending photos through your, your own personal cell phone text messaging patients, and then marketing campaigns. So let's talk about that and how that all, <laughs> how that all works. Yeah. So um, welcome to 2021. Mm-hmm. The challenge you run into is that, you know, texting and emailing is easy and everybody likes it. Everybody wants it. I like it and I want it. So if I want to communicate with my doctor, same thing. I would prefer to use regular email, not the not the portal where I have to have a username and, and a password and everything else. <laughs> you just need to have the proper authorization. The easiest way to do it is when mm-hmm. the patient first shows up, a little document that says, welcome to the practice. Um, many patients prefer email or texting mm-hmm. to communicate. We're, we're happy to honor your request. Now, it's not secure, but A lot of people appreciate the convenience over the security. If you'd like to move forward, just check the box here. And there are a few other things related to the content that you'd have to put in there. But you get the permission up front. That way, you're doing exactly what they want. Now, word to the wise, texting is even a little bit more onerous, meaning that you just need to follow the rules. There is this nasty little law that's been around for over 20 years called TCPA, Mm -hmm. Telephone Consumer Protection Act. It was designed to prevent people from getting telemarketing calls when they were eating dinner at 6 p.m. together. So they would get a call (laughs) on a landline 6 p.m. Now, everybody goes, well, what's a landline? And then what's dinner (laughs) at 6 p.m. that everybody (laughs) eats? But that's how it was designed. And it was also designed to prevent junk faxes, you know, from Mm -hmm from using up the scroll of paper, you know, in the machine. But it has been modernized for the 21st century to address texting and text marketing. And everybody here has gotten it. So if a text message is part of a marketing campaign using automated Mm -hmm. equipment and you don't have the patient's explicit written authorization to opt into a marketing campaign with texting, you can be fined. $500 $500 to $1,500 per text. It's just fodder for class action lawsuits for attorneys. Why? They can smell the money. Yeah. And uh, sure. there, there's no insurance for this mm. and there's no cap on damages. And some of the largest lawsuits in federal court have been TCPA claims. In fact, there is a med spa in the crosshairs where they innocent text marketing campaign. And at the time that I'm you know, that we're having this conversation. I don't know if they're going to have to file for bankruptcy or whether they can get this thing settled, but it's a headache. It's a solvable headache by just saying, hey, look, I got the patient's advanced authorization. They opted in to a marketing campaign at the time they show up. And by the way, I also have their phone number. They gave it to me. So we're all cool. Go ahead and beat up mm-hmm. someone else. We did it right. Oh my God. I did not realize. Thank you for educating me. This is crazy amount of money. But again, just such valuable, I mean, 
information that every practice really needs to know. And so I'm going to get down to these forms and how somebody can work with you and get in touch with you um, at the end. So two more questions, but this is so great. I'm learning so much, Dr. Siegel. Um, So this also just happened. I think I sent you somebody and I know that every practice faces this is situation. So how should, you know, how do we handle patients who threaten to destroy your reputation, right? Online, they're going to go blast a bunch of bad stuff about you or create some campaign, right? If they want their money back, how, do, how should people, gosh, I mean, this happens all the time, right? Okay. So if you had asked me that question a decade ago, I would say, let's fight them. Okay. Yep. Fight them to mm-hmm. the end. Um, I'm older now, a little bit wiser. Here's what I've learned that most patients in a cash pay practice, not only like their doctor, mm-hmm. they love their doctor, whoever is providing the yeah. service, they, they have a good relationship. And if you see one, two, 3000 patients a year, there will be people that slip through that either they had a bad problem and it's a complication everybody can recognize. So both parties um, can agree that there's an issue here or it could be they're just not happy. They just don't mm-hmm. like what they see. You, you could say objectively they did a great, uh, that you did a great job, but they just look in the mirror. They do not see what you see. Um, you could engage in a debate, but what I've learned is that that tends to be soul sucking. Mm-hmm. It, these are people that will lease space in your brain um, and just they just rent a spot in your frontal lobes and they don't leave. <laughs> and it's just it's just not fun. So we put together a program called the Disappear Program. Disappear mm-hmm. stands for the Definitive Innovative Solution Addressing Pissed Off Patients Expecting a Refund. <laughs> I love that. It's a way to draw attention. <laughs> yeah. Well, coming up. Wait, afternoon. wait, let's say it the way I want to <laughs> so disappear. Uh, Definitive, innovative solution addressing pissed off patients expecting a <laughs> refund. Okay. That is freaking amazing. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> so anyway, um, what, what does that mean? If someone is, if someone is threatening you saying they're going to destroy your reputation online, unless you get money back, that's actually a criminal offense mm. and criminal offense means you can go to jail. So, put together a letter that goes out to the patient says, look, uh, you just, and it's not, I'm just cutting to the chase here, but it basically Mm -hmm. says, Hey, uh, you committed a criminal offense that could include jail, but look, we just want all patients to have a positive experience with our practice. We're willing to give you X to go away. We part ways. Here's a release. If you put anything nasty online, you got to take it down. And most people, they'll find that middle ground. They'll find, they'll accept the olive branch. Not all. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you will have a malicious, uh, malicious sociopath in the practice Hmm. um, and they're harder to move on. But most of the time you're able to come to common ground and nobody likes giving back money, but sometimes it's a cost of doing business. And really what you're paying for is peace and a decent night's sleep. So you can continue focusing. I mean, I've seen it where, um, doctor will draw a line in the sand says no way no how not giving them a penny back Mm -hmm. then they get slammed online and i don't know what the damage is in terms of business related to that but it's it's certainly higher than zero then there's a board complaint then they either find a lawyer to sue them or they file a small claims court Um, then they go to the better business bureau i mean it's just a time suck and the point is your time is valuable. You have to figure out how to use it properly and trying to fight an ugly fight with an unhappy patient uh, and win a debate is not a good use of your time. You'll sleep a lot better getting this off your plate as long as it's a reasonable amount. I mean, if they're asking for a hundred thousand dollars, that's not reasonable. And that becomes a different conversation. But if it's just, Hey, just don't like where, you know, how I look after what you did, and the amount is reasonable and it's not going to put you into um, the poor house mm-hmm. and do it, but do it with a release. Now, what about Jeff? Cause this also comes up and I'm sure that there is, uh, you know, legal legalities with how a person responds because, you know, I, I've read enough or been around long enough that if there is a bad review, that there, there is a method to how you respond. And if somebody works with you, do you kind of coach them or teach them what they can and can't say? We actually do it for them. Oh, that's amazing. So um, we have a white paper on this, how to respond to a negative Hmm. review. Okay. Um, And 
one can respond. You just need to respond with HIPAA in mind, which mm -hmm. means don't get into a debate. Don't You can't even acknowledge that that person yeah. is your patient, yeah. but you mm -hmm. can get a message out to the public. Let me give a brief example. Yeah, sure. Let's assume that I did a facelift and the patient got an infection. And mm -hmm. then the patient writes online, Siegel butchered my face, got an infection. I want to charge $10 to fix his screw up. Mm -hmm. And um, here's a potential response. I could say something to the effect of the, the national infection rate for facelift is 1%. In my practice, it's 0.5%. I'm just making up numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what mm -hmm. they are. But, um, you know, we can't get rid of infections for everyone. We wish we could. Occasionally, a patient has a, uh, has a complication. Um, but humans aren't statistics. If it happens to a patient, it's 100% to that patient. Still, we will stand by them. And we offer rev free revisions or revisions where we waive our professional fee for patients who are unhappy and we'll do it within a reasonable time frame. So there, notice what I've not said. I've mm -hmm. not even said, I've not even acknowledged this person was yeah. my patient. Mm -hmm. I've not even talked about their infection. And I've diffused uh, the crisis by saying, I'm not going to charge $10,000 to fix a problem I created. We waive our professional fee you know, if on with the occasional patient who is not happy. And then to boot, we basically said our, our infection rate is lower than the national average, yet another marketing message. So I got two marketing messages in there without having to violate HIPAA. Yay, team. <laughs> God, there's so much crazy stuff. All right, so this is the last question, guys. And this, this question is almost like right up my alley is what Terry Ross Consulting, actually now the new Apex by Terry Ross. Um, and a lot of what we teach in terms of accounting, accrual versus cash, what can go, you know, what can be put on your books on the balance sheet versus the P&L. Um, but I think this is a very fascinating question that most people candidly do it wrong. Um, but as it relates to like legal and malpractice, Jeff, how do we, how do we address patients that prepay, right? There's a lot of people that sell series, right? Yeah. So they, they prepay for a series of treatments and then the client just never shows up. Can that money be considered revenue that you, I mean, you collected the money, you didn't actually perform the treatment. Where, where does that money, I mean, I know where the money goes, but where, where does that money go actually I, sitting on your books? And then what happens from me? I week? know I'm not going to make any friends with my answer. Okay. <laughs> Cause I know everybody wants to keep the money. I would yeah. too. But if someone comes in and they receive nothing over a period of time, then you either need to give them the money back after X number of years, or it goes to that state fund that you can check mm -hmm. their database and see whether you have any money owed to you. Um, here's the challenge. And, and actually, it'll work to your favor, so it's not always bad news. If you purchase a gift certificate or a gift card, for example, and it says you have to use it within a year, it depends what the law in your state is. Sometimes they give you, you know, they basically say, well, not one year. They need to give you three years. So if they turn you down at the restaurant and said, well, too long, you go, no, the law says I, I have up to three years to use it. So it's not just healthcare. There are many industries mm -hmm where if people pay for something, they have to get something in return. Now, every state treats this differently, and you need to understand what the laws in your state are. Uh, and you could also, you know, say if they've scheduled an appointment, you're basically paying for a slot of your time, meaning that they mm -hmm. have gotten something. They may not show up, but they've gotten something. So it depends how you word it. But if, if ultimately they've paid for five treatments, they only had one treatment and never come back. Mm -hmm. At some point, you either need to find them to give them their money back or ultimately it goes to the state. Now, does everybody religiously follow that rule? No, <laughs> but hey, look, don't kill me. I'm just the messenger here. And Jeff, is there is there a time period? And is it one year? Like, is there a time period that, you know, these practices should be cognizant of? I think it, it's going to vary state by state. I have seen it. The last state I looked at, it was a state on the East Coast. It was a five-year window of time, meaning that they had five years to use it up. And it was real drag in that practice because they had sold the practice. Mm -hmm. And then that they did have some people showing up, you know, three, four years later. And the new practice had to honor it. And it wasn't bundled into the selling price. 
Mm-hmm. And so not a happy experience, but ultimately, you know, you're in the business of trying to keep patients for life. And if you can get beyond that hiccup, then, you know, ultimately it, it won't be so painful. Okay. Well, this, you guys, I hope that you found this podcast, like all of my podcasts with my most amazing, brilliant guests. Um, Fascinating. Like I said, I have learned so much, Jeff, I always do. And so if anybody wants to contact you, work with you, and you guys, I think there was two components. I mean, we got Mr. Smarty Pants here on with me, (laughs) Dr. Siegel, but for two very, very critical things. And for all of you guys that know me, work with me, listen to me, follow me. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. I'm only always wanting to bring you the very best, again, of solutions, of resources, of information, of people that you can go to that are vetted, that are experts, where you're not going to waste your time, you're not going to waste your money, and you are going to be so set up for success. So um, again, Dr. Siegel is um, the founder and owner of two companies, which was Medical Justice, as I mentioned, who is going to help you from being sued um, for any frivolous reason. In addition to eMerit, which is that online reputation we're all wanting, and it sounds like he's got this amazing platform. They do it for you. They're, they're going to be pushing out content for you. In addition to all these templates, which, God, I want the templates. So um, how, how does somebody, Jeff, contact you? How can they work with you? What's the best way to reach easy, you? Easy to find peasy. You? Go to our website, medicaljustice.com, medicaljustice.com. You can sign up for a free 15-minute consultation, confidential um, you don't need a Groupon. It's free. And then sign up on our mailing list when you get there. And if you like what you see, come join the organization. But um, the consultation is free. Okay, guys, I love that. I invite you, if you're in this situation, if you just want to talk to Dr. Siegel and his team and learn how what his services can do for your business, I invite you to please do that. And again, if you are not part of my tribe and my family, I invite you to the Aesthetic Accelerator group. That is my private Facebook group. And then I certainly invite you, if you do not know about our new company, Apex by Terry Ross, please go to apexplatform.com, check out our new solutions-based software, um, how this can help you elevate your practice, improve efficiency, ultimately make more money for all the things you guys need. But thank you for being with me. Love you guys so much. Again, my tribe are my people and uh, keep the feedback coming. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks for listening to In Touch with Terry. For more information regarding Apex, the aesthetic game changer, visit apexplatform.com. That's apxplatform.com. We'll include links to everything in the episode notes, including links to all of the ways that you can follow Terry Ross Consulting on all social media platforms. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening from. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of In Touch with Terry.